Now let's look at international logistics within the supply chain and the effects of infrastructure. We want to understand the importance of infrastructure to any country to an international export. We also want to look and identify some of the challenges with international transportation infrastructure. Some of the characteristics of international communication infrastructure. Phone, cable, cellular and then identify some key items within the international utilities infrastructure. Do we have enough water? Do we have enough electricity? The infrastructure basically varies everywhere in the world. What we do in the US isn't necessarily what we would do in Japan or in Europe. Some countries have major infrastructural challenges. Other developed portions of the world enjoy state-of-the-art or high-tech capabilities for conducting international trade. Even here in the US, basically the world leader in technology, we have infrastructure requirements because of increased transportation demands. We had, had rolling blackouts just a few years ago. How did those blackouts affect manufacturing, distribution, communication, and supply? Railroads in recent decades throughout the U.S. have been enlarged. We created larger clearances, blew out mountainsides, increase the length of bridges and tunnels in order to accommodate double stack container trains giving the US a competitive advantage there. Ports have had to enlarge throughout the world facilities for increased container traffic and increased in the ship sizes. Ships are only getting bigger. And then the highways when they have trucks coming out of these customs and out of these ports can it take the local infrastructure? Highways are strained handling truck traffic. How many of you have been stuck on the freeway and nothing's worse than when you see dozens of large trucks in front of you? All in all, without adequate infrastructure throughout the world, international trade would basically come to a halt. Now the question is, what is infrastructure? For this class, infrastructure is the basic facilities, services, and installations that are needed for the function of any community or society such as transportation and communication. But it's going to be a, a generic collective term for the subordinate parts of undertaking substructure foundations. And the permanent installations forming a basis for military operations as airfield, naval bases, training establishments. In the port of Long Beach, no matter how good and sophisticated the port is, how high-tech customs is, how high-quality the security is, once those containers leave the port, will they congest the local freeway system? How do they get around that? In the field of logistics, the definition can be really broad, widespread, and cover a lot of issues. Infrastructure basically then is a collective term that refers to all the elements in place, both publicly and privately owned goods to facilitate transportation, communication, and business exchanges. There's two things really important is that some countries infrastructure might be publicly owned while in other countries it may be private. And in addition, communication isn't just roads, utilities, it's also business exchanges and we'll talk some more about that. It would therefore include not only transportation and communication elements, but also the existence of quality public utilities, banking services, retail distribution channels, and think about it, why not court systems? If you have a court case to protect your contract, is it f going to be fair? Is it going to be equitable? Is it even enforceable? Can they defend intellectual property rights? and what are the standards? All of these collectively can influence international trade and or a country's infrastructure. Now let's look at port infrastructure for ocean shipping. Here's a traditional port berth in Miami. A berth being basically a parking lot for a large container ship. Now key things we have to look at in these ports is its water draft. For example, what's the depth of water? The depth of water determines the size of ships that can come to that port and call on that port. 
Few ports have natural depths of 40 feet required for the biggest ships. As a result, they have to dredge that port every day. In Shanghai, their ports are dredged daily because of silt that builds up. They have ships coming across with large chain-like rakes pulling away the dirt at the bottom of the ocean so all those container ships that are leaving Shanghai for the rest of the world can get out so the largest ships in the world can get in to Shanghai's port. Then we have like the air draft, the clearance between a ship and a bridge. Is it large enough? Think of large cities like New York City who have bridges or London who have bridges that were built hundreds of years ago. Traffic goes over them on a daily basis. That traffic is humans. These humans vote. No one wants to see these bridges coming up, although it's beautiful to watch as a tourist. If you're a commuter coming into town, that can really affect your travel. So people don't like to have bridges slowing down traffic. So your ship, your goods, your services may be limited on how they can come into and outside a city. So therefore they may have to go to an outlying port and that might have a lot of inland transportation. Things you must think about. And then the cranes we see here, those beautiful red cranes, those are worth millions of dollars. They have to reach across a ship, pick up those containers and bring them back. Large ships prevent cranes from actually reaching all the way across. Well, that's a problem because these ships can't easily come and turn around. Crane modifications can be very expensive. In one of my previous companies, we had a division that coded these cranes. Coding one of these cranes was anywhere from $350,000 to $500,000 just to coat those cranes with rust-proof paints. Now that's expensive to give you an idea of the value of these cranes. And then what about the port operations? Many ports have really strong union ties which may limit operations. For example, Long Beach Port, one of the busiest ports in the world, it only has eight hours of operations. Whereas you may go to Buenos Aires, Argentina, it's a much smaller port. It works 24-7. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in Japan, ports, they go on strike all the time, which is very un-Japanese, but you need to be aware about it. These ports also may have space limitations. How much room, how many berth spaces do they have? Does your ship have to sit out in the water with your goods sitting in the ship for an extended period of time? And when they bring it on shore, is there warehousing space? If not, the probability of the cargo exposed to elements are high. Whenever humans touch things, the chance of pilferage or theft increases tremendously. And then, is there refrigerated areas? If you're shipping roses or high quality wines or frozen juice concentrate, will these containers continue to be refrigerated? And finally, the connection to the land-based transportation services. How will we get out of the port? Are we going to have this big clog at the port taking hours if not days to get out. In the United States we've figured this out over time but in newer ports like in Vietnam they're building modern port facilities but their connection to land-based transportation services such as trains and, and roads is so far behind that sometimes you leave the ports in Vietnam and it may take you days just to get to the city and through the traffic. Now always remember this is a very competitive marketplace. Here's an example of the port infrastructure in Rotterdam. As you can see here they have an indented port. You can get cranes from both sides. This way you can basically unload things faster. Now why would they do that? Well one reason is it's faster. If your products want to go into the European market how does Rotterdam compete against London, France, Germany. Well, they say come to our port, our indented ports, we can get the goods off the ships faster than anybody else. It gives them a competitive advantage. But at the same time they have a challenge is the shipbuilders of the world, Japan, Korea, China, when they're building these ships, they're trying to build bigger ships. 
the bigger the ship, the more containers they can put on it, the more containers they can put on it, the better return on their investment. But it's a very competitive business because everyone is fighting for market entry and part of that $2 trillion. And when dealing with international experts, make sure your partner, your customs broker, your freight forwarder, which is basically a travel agent for freight, understands what's going on locally. You can see here in southern Korea that a hurricane wiped out millions of dollars of cranes. It'll take weeks, if not months, to get them all back up and running. How will that affect your shipment? How will that affect your cost? Are you insured for this? All questions you have to be considering. So make sure the people you're working with have up-to-date local knowledge. As we mentioned earlier, the Port of Long Beach and the Port of Los Angeles are two of the busiest ports in the world. Combined, one would argue that the largest port area in the entire world. Well, obviously, that would put tremendous strain on the local transportation infrastructure. Understanding this, the ports got together and they created this underground train system called the Alameda Corridor. Most of the houses and businesses around it don't even notice it. But basically, this takes a lot of cargo, and as you can see in this picture, double stacked cargo, containers up top of other containers, and it takes them outside of Los Angeles, just a little northeast, so it misses most of the common traffic that the consumers or residents of the area use. So this is an efficient way to connect to land-based transportation. What they do is they limit people using trucks coming into the Orange County, LA County marketplace. Only locally can you take trucks on the containers. Otherwise, most of the time you'll put it on this train and it'll go outside of LA to service the rest of the United States. Now, when you look at shipping, you have to look at canals and waterways too. Because in maritime transportation, a lot of the ships are dependent on the existence of reliable canals. Canals and locks must be large enough to take these ships. And the larger ships that can get through, for example, the Suez Canal are called Suez Max ships. Likewise, the larger ships that can get through the Panama Canal are called Panamax ships. Ships that are too large are post Panamax ships. They're basically too big to go through the current canals. Right now, Panama is going under initiative to widen the canal. They want to make sure these post Panamax ships will still come through the canal so they can basically get revenue. It's critical for their existence. Now, logistically speaking, there's straits and canals all over the world, such as the Bosporus Strait in Turkey. It's really the only link between the Black Sea and other oceans, and it's really become the primary trade route for Russia and the world. Now, the problem is, even though Russia's benefiting from this, it's become a really big concern from pollution and safety for nearby Istanbul. In the next slide, we're going to talk about the Suez Canal, but it's even smaller. It's more costly, and it's really shallow, so it can't take the largest ships. But it really does help a lot of international shipments from having to go all the way around Africa. Then, as we have here, we have the Panama Canal, the most famous of all canals. It prevents requirements of sailing all around South America. If I'm taking my wine from Napa and selling it to Argentina, how do I get it there? Do I send it through inland transportation in the United States? That could be really expensive. Do I send it all the way around South America? That could take a long time in exposing my wines to the elements, or do I go through the Panama Canal? It's slow. It's only one direction of operation at one time. Basically, you have to wait 22 hours to 48 hours to get through, and still lacks really rail and land bridges once you go through it but it basically connects the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. Here in the United States we have the St. Lawrence Seaway which links the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. It's narrow, big ships really can get through it and unfortunately with our winters up in the Great Lake areas 
lot of times it freezes over and has to close down and forcing then all the people who would use this waterway to use alternate means of transportation during these months which can increase the cost of doing business now remember this is a two trillion dollar business so people are always looking at new ways to improve upon things I mentioned one they're gonna make the Panama Canal bigger that's gonna cost hundreds of millions of dollars to widen a canal other possibilities exist though a canal right through Nicaragua like a river free of locks parallel to the Panama Canal now why would Nicaragua do it they could get a tremendous amount of money but it would be a significant investment a canal through the Malay Peninsula would bypass the Strait of Malacca and the Port of Singapore connecting Southeast Asia and Asia together quicker there's also the wars in the Balkan destroyed all the bridges on the Danube River blocking freshwater transit between the Black Sea and Northern Europe now freshwater transit between the Mediterranean Sea and Northern Europe and the canals between the Rhone River and the Rhine River all of these canals and waterways are competitive means of getting products from one location to another in the United States, one might be used the Mississippi River, River, taking things from the north of the United States to the south. Now, here's a quick look at the Suez Canal in Egypt. From this perspective, it looks like the boat's going across dry land. But you can see how many containers are filling that up. But it's an expensive way to ship goods. But if it gets it there faster, it may be worth that investment. And here's the Corinth Ca Canal in Greece. As you can see here, we talked about post Panamax ships, ships that are too big for the Panama Canal. Post Suez Max ships, ships that are too big for the Suez Canal. As you can see here, in the Corinth Canal in Greece, there's no way they're going to be able to widen this. It's obviously limited based on natural walls. But this is heavily used. And you can see the ropes in this picture that it's not steering itself, it's actually being pulled through the canal. Now let's talk airport transportation. Let's look at their infrastructure. This picture, as they say, is worth a thousand words. I've traveled all my life, even as a small child, throughout the United States. So seeing new location wasn't a big deal. My first time flying into Hong Kong in the early 90s, we flew into Kai Tech Airport in Hong Kong. It's now closed, but as you can see in this Cathay Pacific airplane it's flying right through the center of Hong Kong and at that time it was the second most dangerous airport to fly into well as we're flying into this airport people start getting up and saying hey come over here see this or see that in my own little arrogance I said I've seen everything this is no big deal it's just another flight into a city but given the amount of people who got up and went to one side of the airplane I decided I'd look out too and to my shock and awe I could literally, from that airplane, look into those houses, see a family watching TV. I would know that it was a soccer match, and I could tell you that the teams were green and white. I also knew, whoa, we are way too close. It was a crazy, crazy time. Now, this is an extreme example, and their Kaitak is no longer open. But in the international environment, even here domestically, we need to look at airports as a literal way of transporting goods. It gets there fast. But runways, the length of runways, determine whether or not an airport can handle large cargo planes. And the number of runways determines the capacity of an airport. Like in the Hong Kong example, these airports were built a long, long time ago, and the city built up around it. So therefore, the runway length wasn't long enough, and they needed to build new airports. This is seen in every major city in the world. Then we need to look at space. How much space is there for all this cargo? Most airports are landlocked and cannot expand. Just think of New York City. Think of London. Think of Malaysia. They've all had to build extra airports. In general, most of us, when we fly into New York City, we actually fly into New Jersey, Newark Airport, and travel across. Then we have to look at the hours of operation. How often can we send goods and services via an airport? 
here locally in Orange County, John Wayne or Orange County Airport, you can't actually leave before 7 a.m. and you can't fly in after 10 p.m. So if your flight's delayed or you miss your flight, there's a good chance you have to either wait a day or fly into another airport, which is really inconvenient. As well as in Orange County, there's a lot of wealthy people who live right around the airport area. So they control its hours of operation. They don't want to be woken up early in the morning with planes taking off or late in the evening with planes landing. Now, Orange County Airport also has one of the oddest takeoffs of all. It actually accelerates quickly and then decelerates, almost dropping like an amusement ride because, again, they're going over wealthy homes that are near the Pacific Ocean and they decelerate for noise abatement. And then finally, warehouse space. Airports need to have proper facilities to protect the cargo from the elements. In California, it's not a big deal, but can you imagine... In Minnesota, New York, Japan, all of these have northern latitudes and cold winters. Or in the far south where it's raining all the time, are the goods protected? How will your goods be taken care of? All of these are key issues when you think about infrastructure at airports. Now, Hong Kong closed down Kai Tak and they opened Cheplakok Airport in Hong Kong. This became the largest infrastructure project in the world, significantly more expensive than the channel. All the land you see out there is reclaimed land, meaning just 10 years before it was built, it was all water. Incredibly expensive project. The question we have to ask ourselves, why would they do this? Well, cargo is a big issue. They want everyone in Asia to fly through Hong Kong to drop off their cargo as a gateway to China or everyone in going to Asia to stop through Hong Kong. It's a very efficient and effective way to travel. This is a beautiful place. The way I wish transportation from an airport was in the United States. You land, you immediately get on a walkway, you go through customs quickly, you pick up your luggage quickly, you immediately get put on a metro train it takes you to the city center when you get off the train there's taxis to your left buses to major hotels to your right and then the subway system just down the hall very simple and easy way but this is a huge investment so why do they do it they want a big piece of that two trillion dollar international logistics pie they want to make sure that people want to come through Hong Kong, both for tourism, but also for international business activities. Well, now let's look at transportation from a rail perspective. Railways, ever since the 18th century, there's been developed of railroads that often have followed military strategies. They were used to help move troops from point A to point B in a cost-effective manner. Now, Moving troops is a good thing and a bad thing. Who wants troops moved into their country? So countries like Spain and Russia, they used varied gauges, different widths, so c companies or countries could not easily move their product and services or their troops right across your border. In the picture we have here on the screen, this is a dual gauge track in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. I'm sorry for my Portuguese. I hope I have not offended any of my Brazilian friends. The gauges are when railroads were first built. They were installed unique sizes. These unique sizes are different. The Russia and the Spanish example are just one of many. Now, in China, the rail infrastructure has been unable to keep up with its economic growth as they manufacturing goods for the world economy train or rail is a great way to get goods from point A to point B in a cost-effective manner, but they have tremendous backlogs. And in Europe and Japan, they would love to use their rail more for commercial application, but to be honest, 70 to 80 percent of all rail use is focused on passengers. Since the 1990s and now into today's world, we've all moved towards a more multimodal transportation method. Multiple modes of transportation using one type of container. A container can go from the ocean, 
can then be dropped in a truck, then put on a train, then taken off a train, put back on a truck or another ship for multiple modes. These factors are contributing to a renewal of merchandise traffic on railways. There's no more rail cars where you load by hand and unload by hand. Now you can take it straight from a ship and maybe even drop it right on a train. This is decreasing road congestion. It helps reduce the pollution and noise and it's put a focus on building more and more multimodal containers. Now we're seeing a modernization of the rail moving away from the box cars to piggyback cars carrying truck trailers and to container cars. In America we've kind of given up on the hope of using the US rail for passengers and we're focused on freight. We can now double stack our containers on one train. That can't happen in Europe and or Japan because of their focus on passenger trains. There are plans to even modernize the Trans-Siberian Railroad for freight shipments from Asia, such as Vladivostok, to Europe by rail. And there are plans for a Trans-Asia Railroad connecting Singapore and Seoul to Europe via Turkey. Increased U.S. rail modernization has resulted in land bridges. The fact is, Asian companies and European companies saw the U.S. infrastructure as an opportunity. We already have very modern commercial transportation, fast freight as you might call it, so a large ship coming to the west coast of the United States from Asia can be unloaded in a multimodal basis, dropped on trains, fast freight shipped across the U.S., and then reloaded onto a ship on the Atlantic and shipped to Europe. It's a very good way to ship from one location to the other. It's faster than the Panama Canal, and in many cases even cheaper. We call this land bridges. Now you can see here, this is a double stack rail car here in the U.S. Because we've given up on rail as a possibility for our passenger transportation, a long time ago the U.S. government began to blow up bridges, blow away mountainsides so we could double load our containers. We can send twice as much goods over a fixed rail than our counterparts in Europe and Asia. But what I want to challenge you, as Americans, we may see rail as the obvious way to transport goods from point A to point B. But we've got to remember, in other markets, it's not necessarily the same way, such as in Europe, Japan. They can't do this even if they wanted to. And here is what we call a traditional boxcar one simple door and everything has to be loaded and unloaded manually and the more humans touch something the more chance that things are going to drop be broken or even the potential of pilferage now more importantly though is it's going to really slow things down you would have to take everything out and reload it onto another container so when there are problems at the end where the product is damaged or something's wrong you have multiple people that might be involved having a multimodal system where the container leaves the factory with a sealed lock and arrives at the client's premise with a seal you know that no one has been in that container since it was manufactured it's a great way to provide security and here's a simple example of taking it from a ship and immediately just putting on a train in a multimodal environment. And now let's look at road infrastructure. We need to look at three different things. Quality of the roads. What type of congestion? Heck, look at this picture. This is traffic congestion in Lahore, Pakistan. But you can find this in the Philippines, in Africa, and many parts of the developing world. And then look at how civil engineering structures can get us quicker from point A to point B. Now, just because the roads are paved doesn't always mean the roads are in good quality. Some paved roads are in really bad shape. The existence of high quality roadways is really, really important to the continuous flow of goods. To give you an example about quality, in Poland, the Polish government states that 80% of their roads are in poor condition. Well, that tells you in that market, maybe you don't want to be using roads as a way to transfer your goods from point A to point B. Then there's congestion. 
In this type of congested market, as we see here in Pakistan, there's a big chance that your goods won't get to location. It may, may, it may miss a customer deadline. It may miss a air shipment. It may miss a sea shipment. And also the chance of pilferage or theft is increased tremendously. In many countries, traffic congestion is still stifling and preventing goods to move quickly from location to location. And finally, we also have engineering structures that can overcome great distances. Structures such as bridges and tunnels need to be built in many places in order to conveniently navigate that landscape. So road infrastructure from country to country may really differ. It takes an investment. So make sure you're working with partners that understand the local road infrastructure. Now this definitely qualifies as a poor quality road. Obviously if we're driving a truck or a car, we see this and we go around it or we go slower. But please imagine in business doing congestion, the truck might not see it. Or it's raining and it looks like a sheet of glass across it all. If a truck's going full speed, it's going to hit it. It could damage the truck or it could damage the goods in the back of the truck. And a lot of times you find out your goods were damaged when your customers tell you. Or if it's damaged and the truck goes to the side of the road, when they fix the truck, were your goods protected or did the driver have to leave the truck unattended? All these could lead to delays and additional costs. So understanding the quality of the road, yeah, it's important. Now here's an example of the Malau Bridge in southern France. This is simply put a architecturally invested civil structure that helped get us from one part of the mountain to the other. If you look closely you can see the road as it winds down the mountain from our right goes across the bridge and slowly winds up the other side. Now is that bridge necessary? No. It's attractive, it's a large investment, but also makes the farmers, the manufacturers in this area, more competitive in the very competitive European Union. This is an investment by the government to keep their merchants, keep their manufacturers in a competitive nature. Now, another part of the communication infrastructure is mail services. How do you get mail delivered domestically or internationally? In some countries, mail will be delivered really quickly, but in others, mail delivery can be very, very slow. If I send a letter from Orange County to New York, it's going to take four or five days using standard post. Whereas in the European Union, they have initiatives where mail will go from one country to the next within one to two business days something they believe in, making it mail a more affordable and more accommodating public utility. Is it reliable? In some countries, not all mail is delivered. It is lost, it's abandoned, or sometimes just even stolen. I've just got some paperwork from our Brazilian office, and they sent it a month and a half ago. It was supposed to arrive here in five days. Was it the Brazilian side? Was it the American side? All I can tell you is we got the post much later than we needed. Delays. In some countries, postal unions have a lot of power and strike can delay the delivery of important documents. Contracts. Intellectual property. All things that are important in our business. Now firms such as FedEx, UPS, and DHL help make up for these shortcomings. They're privatized in this area. However, while these services are very reliable, they are generally much, much more expensive than the public postal services. Now in some countries, they actually subsidize their public post office. Now that could be also a business opportunity for you because some companies are using arbitrage by shipping mail in bulk to a country with low postal rates and then doing bulk bailings from that country. So you can take advantage of any kind of subsidized infrastructure. Now let's look at telecommunication services. 
demand for voice and data communication service has been increasing. In some countries, the economy has grown, but the communication infrastructure has not. Well, these countries, do they have to wait to put in this new communication infrastructure, maybe like this picture, to keep up with the rest of the world? Or what they can do is leapfrog. People who have been waiting for landlines and telecommunication because the infrastructure isn't there to support their needs have just leapfrogged the old technology or outmoded traditional telephone service and used cell phones. It was quicker and all of a sudden countries like the Czech Republic and China have very sophisticated communication networks. Now while some countries have reliable inexpensive phone lines others do not and leapfrogging works for them. Now some countries built cell phone networks quickly often because they just didn't have that good landline network. This has given them a competitive advantage. They have very modern infrastructure. And finally, can you imagine not having internet access in today's world? You couldn't use Skype, which is a fundamental way to communicate internationally. You couldn't use the internet or email. Access to the internet is still limited and even cost prohibitive in some areas. So how would you communicate? Heck, most of the people I know don't even have a fax machine anymore. They just scan an email. So telecommunications are different throughout the world. If you're going to open up an office or move to another location or have a partner in another location, you may want to understand how their telecommunications infrastructure is holding up, how it might affect your business. Usually it always works, but in those critical times when you need it the most, can you rely on it? Now let's look at the utilities infrastructure. What are our challenges in electricity? Is it reliable? Is it sufficient for production capacity? Will it cause blackouts or brownouts? Is it limited productivity? Can you imagine if you are manufacturing a sensitive product and the electricity runs out? Are there backup generators to support it? And then water and sewer. How do you get access to clean water in your manufacturing process to your living residences? How about sewer issues? They're fundamentally important for many manufacturing processes. It can be even an issue for developed countries where the infrastructure is older or inefficient. Heck, we had brownouts not long ago here in California. Were there plans in place? A lot of times there weren't because we weren't used to it in an affected business. Then energy like this pipeline between Russia and Europe. Do we have reliable pipelines that are available to deliver natural gas or oil products to the locations where they can be used? And finally, theft. In some areas, theft of utilities is also common, making it difficult for utility companies to earn a profit or even want to invest in new infrastructure. For example, copper, copper wiring. It's stolen because its value in developing countries on the open market is important. Now there are a lot of infrastructure needs that you can get into and I want to just name a couple such as like the banking infrastructure. How does money come into a country? How does money leave a country? Are there expenses for it? Is the currencies convertible? What are the fees? How are the documents for financial transactions transmitted? Are they secure? Simple things but you don't want to find these out after you start to work in a country? Do they have different methods of payment? Do they have document exchanges that makes exchanging documents easy? Can you go to a local branch or do you have to fly to another city? Then we have the business services infrastructure where how do you get products moving? Do they have a freight forward network which is basically a travel agent for your freight and cargo? Do they have customs brokers? What are the different distribution channels. Is it agents, distributors, supermarkets, wholesalers, retails? How are things priced? Then look at the court infrastructure. Will they protect your interests in the courts? Where are courts taking place? Is it the capital? Is it the state or provincial level? If it's at the provincial level or state level, will your partner have more connections than you will? How fast are court cases even adjudicated? In Brazil, 
we were about to sign some contracts and our partners uh, reminded us that we may want to be hesitant with our end users signing a contract because even though Brazilian court system, particularly in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, is very transparent, there is a backlog and most court cases don't get adjudicated for five to ten years. Well, a small company like ours, we can't afford to wait five to ten years. We'll be out of business in, as we wait to get a court case that we may automatically win but can't wait to get the judgment so does that court system have a arbitration or mediation clause these are now common in the United States but are they common in that foreign country is intellectual property infrastructure there what is the IP law will they protect your trademarks your brands if, especially if you have an international brand will they court system recognize these international trademarks copyrights and patents or do they even recognize it as something important companies and countries that are in the development stage don't see intellectual property as a primary focus given their development now that's a cultural choice that's a necessity choice however Intellectual property for you may be one of your factors of endowment and you want to make sure it's protected. And then the standards infrastructure. What are their standards? When they say something's environmentally friendly, what does that mean? Is it the same standard we have back here? When they say it's organic, if it's green, uh, what are their metric versus English system? All these standards could have a large issue on your product being delivered to market after service, in communication so as you look at the new markets you want to make sure that the way you do business where you have your core competency how you're successful can it be repeated in a foreign market and these are some of the other infrastructural needs that you may want to consider when choosing a market or at least understand the risk you might be taking so you get a commensurate reward good luck and I know that when you look at these infrastructure issues the more you dig the more you're gonna find out and here's just different standards. In Brazil, a truck has a different tire pressure monitoring system. It's not a big deal, but you'll need to know how this is used, especially if you're selling to this marketplace. All these different standards can be key. This is just one simple picture to try to illustrate that standards are different from country to country. And having someone who has that local knowledge is important. Hope this understanding of infrastructure tells you about the questions you might want to ask to find out if your partner which could be a freight forwarder or a customs broker or an agent or distributor really do understand the local environment <music>